from? A lot of times when we when we get successful and we get up in status, like we forget where we come from and we start looking down on others and not helping other people, you know? Like we get cocky and we just start smelling ourselves. When we start to smell yourself, just keep that jar of mud near you so you can smell that to know where you come from and where you are can be stripped tomorrow. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. There will still be the journey. The journey. New Sheriff in town. Name is the journey. Journey. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is the journey. The journey. What is it that moved you? The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey initiative is generously supported by Nike's Black Community Commitment. Welcome back to another episode of The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today we have a Memphis icon that I know you're going to love. But before we get to him, we got to do our quote. Now, quote comes from Apple founder Steve Jobs and it goes a little something like this the only way to do great work is to love what you do once again the only way to do great work is to love what you do today's icon absolutely loves what he does a Memphis native musician entrepreneur visionary community leader and on top of all that, a phenomenal friend. With no further ado, we have Brother Marcus Malone. How you doing, sir? How you doing, brother? I'm amazing. Thank well, you. thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming and sharing a few moments with us. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. This is a great thing you're doing in the city. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so, sir. listen, we always started out. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the early years. Tell me, like, the neighborhood where you grew up. Okay. Who was in the household, that kind of stuff. Okay, I grew up in a small town, Kyrieville, right outside of Memphis. Kyrieville. Shout out to Kyrieville. Man, don't nobody know about Kyrieville. All y'all say y'all from Memphis anyway. <laughs> we do, because we don't want to be questioned with, where is Kyrieville? Where is Kyrieville? I represent Kyrieville everywhere I go, though. Okay. Everywhere. Okay. So, grew up uh, in a household with my mom, my aunts, my uncle. You okay. Know, I attended a church called St. Mark. Okay. Started playing drums at the age of five, you know, like everybody else beating on pots and pans, oh, yeah. using oh, yeah. my mom head as a cymbal. <laughs> 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 that got me started in music, and uh, I was playing at church when I was five years old, playing really? the drums, making five dollars a Sunday. Okay, yeah, oh, that's taking big it straight money. to the candy lady. That's big money right there, boy. Shoot. <laughs> straight, and to straight to the candy straight lady. To the candy lady. You know that's door. something. Yeah. That, you know, I was born and raised in, in Louisville, Kentucky, and I tell mm -hmm. you, it's funny because. I don't care where you from, where you at, there was always a candy lady always. in the hood. A candy always lady. a candy lady. Yes, sir. So, okay, who outside of your parents, or those that was in the household, mm -hmm. had the biggest influence on the young Marcus? Outside of the household, it was a group, a quartet group. I'm not sure if you're familiar with quartet music. Or okay, not, but, I am. I am. Um, it was a guy named Cedric Connor. He was a okay. phenomenal drummer in, okay. the, in the community, and he used to twirl them sticks at the end of each song, and okay. you know, I wanted to be just like Cedric. And I can I can remember he used to put me in his lap. I was too young to reach the foot pad on the right. drum, so he used to put right. me in his lap and and let me play. And and from then I just I was dreaming to be a great musician one day. And his whole group, the Echo Airs, like they inspired me to to just be a great drummer at the time. So okay. I was playing drums, and then at twelve, we lost our organ player at the church, and right. so I kind of got forced on the organ. Really? And I didn't know nothing but bass lines. And okay. my mom, husband, he's a musician. And we'll right. talk about him later, uh, Fred Banks. Okay. He started showing me how to put those chords with that, with that left hand. And, you right. know, it all just came came to pass. Really? Yep. Do, were, do you feel like you were just already musically inclined? Or? I think I do. I uh -huh. think I do. My dad don't play. My mom don't play. But it, it does run in my family. I do okay. got cousins that, that play instruments, so maybe some ancestors that were great musicians. But right, right. Because all my siblings are musicians. Really? All my siblings. So mom, dad didn't. Nope. But all the siblings are yep. musicians. My stepdad's a musician, so his okay. his kids are musically inclined by default by him. But okay. my dad, kids, me and my brothers, we are naturally musically inclined. Okay, okay. Your stepdad wasn't a mailman. No, I'm not. <laughs> 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 what did what did what decision did you make as a young person that ended up having a lifelong impact? Even though mm -hmm. at the time you didn't know it was going to be have a lifelong impact on you. Oh, uh, the decision I made was just really just taking everything that I learned from my aunts. You know. Okay. Um, a lot of women raised me, so okay. just taking those things and just applying it to life and just learning how to treat people and, you know, okay. 
one thing that I kind of regret when I was younger, trying to grow up too fast. Right, right, I, I right. I grew up too fast. I was around older people, so right. I got that old spirit. But right. mom always told me, slow down. You don't want to be grown too fast. Okay, okay. And she was right about that. How different are you from the person you dreamed to be, that you would be? Now, you said you wanted to be a musician from mm -hmm. the moment you sat there. Right. So I'm wondering, was there ever a time that you dreamed of being police officer, fireman, mm -hmm. any of those things outside of being a musician? Mm, not really. I don't got the fireman, police story. Okay. Like, honest to God, the neighborhood I grew up because in my neighborhood it was a park, Harris Park. Right. And which is now Nikki McCray Park. Okay. But and she's a Hooper. A, uh, yep. Shout a out Hooper, to Nikki. Yeah. Shout out to Nikki. But in that neighborhood, I, I really wanted to be tough. I really, I wanted to be a gangster. I wanted to be a gangster disciple. Like. Oh really? <laughs> Nobody know this, but that's what I wanted to be because, like, in my neighborhood, like, we, we grew up in the park, so we right. was fighting and playing ball and all right. this. Most of the people around me, my friends, like, they all wanted to be about their life, you right. know? And so that's what I thought that I had to be. So I you had wanted to be, to be a GD? I wanted to be a gangster. Oh, wow, <laughs> man. That's so breaking news, everybody. Yeah, yeah, that's breaking Marcus news. Marcus got some gangster in it. <laughs> I did. What's your why, Marcus? My why? My yeah. why is because I, I want to live on purpose. Okay. I don't what wait. does that mean? Unpack that a little bit. Living on, it's a lot of young people listening to you right, right now. Right. Unpack that. I want to live on purpose. Uh, God called us to live on purpose. God called us to this earth to, to, to be who he created us to be. And you right. know, when we waste time not pursuing what he called us to be, then we, we're not living on, by his will. So that's my why. My why is for my three children. You know, I want to show them an example of, of what you can be without a college education. My why is for other people around me that look up to me uh, just to let them know that you don't have to be perfect. But, you know, life is, is a marathon, not a sprint. That's my why. So I want to be that positive role model that, that you, you can be successful doing positive things. And you don't have to sell drugs. You don't have to be a gangbanger. You don't have to do all the things the world say that we have to do to look stronger. You right. know, like just trust God and, and he got you. That's my why to, and to inspire people. Tell us a time when you felt like you were in your purpose when you were literally right on the note. In my purpose. Woo. Well, that, that come from fast. Now, I'm not trying to be too deep, but I, I, I got saved. And, and that's my only answer to everything, because God is the reason why I, I'm where I'm at, because I'm basically self-taught. And, you know, right. uh, to be in positions that I am right. to play for Cameo and to play with Stephanie Mills and to play for other national artists without being self-taught. Mm -hmm. I knew that was my purpose and just being ready and people acclimating. Wait, wait, wait. Time out. Time out. <laughs> you mean tell me you ain't never had a class or nothing? Never. Never. And you on the stage with Stephanie Mills yes, sir. and Cameo yes, and, sir. and the like. Yes, sir. Oh, living yeah. in your purpose. Of, yes, sir. Uh, you say your gift will make room <laughs> for man, you. Definitely, I'm a witness. It'll make room <laughs> for you. Because this is all I, I haven't worked a job since I was 19. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I've seen the world. I've seen, I met a lot of amazing people. I've been a music director for a lot of events. And, and, and it blow my mind every time I get off stage. I thank God because I'm like, man, mm -hmm. you did this. Like, I used to practice in, in my bedroom in the dark, just crying one day that somebody would hear me because I'm from Kyrieville, so right. I didn't have a lot of mentors right. to show me you doing this right, bro, or right. do this, do this. Like I just had to get it how it came. Memphis, Memphis grew me up. The the music community in Memphis is if you can make it out of Memphis being a musician or creative, you can make it anywhere in the world. Fantastic. Yes sir. Well listen, I got one last question for you uh -huh. on this segment. And you talked about going all over the world. And I can remember being in France was the first place that I felt like I didn't necessarily feel the heaviness of racism. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, what was the first time that you, Marcus Malone, mm -hmm. realized you were a black man? Wow. Hold on, okay. hold on for a second. Okay. Listen, we're going to come right back here on the journey with Brother Marcus Malone. He's going to share with us when he realized he was a brother. So listen, stay right there. We'll be right back. The Journey on the Kazuchiya Network. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. Success in life is not a straight line. There are twists and turns in everyone's life, and the more you know about their story, the more you'll understand the process. Kazuki and Media Group proudly presents The Journey, a show that features successful black men in Memphis telling their stories of their lives and the ups and downs they've encountered on their ultimate road to success. 
We believe the journey will encourage young men and help them see that life is a journey. Watch The Journey, hosted by me, Larry Robinson. Brought to you by the Kazuchia Media Group in partnership with the Delta Boule. I told you, I told you, listen, you're back, or we're back on the journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today we have a bad brother, Brother Marcus Malone. Before we left, we had asked Marcus about when he realized he was a brother. But before he answers that question, every superhero has a superpower. And I want to know, Marcus, what's your superpower? My superpower is, is, is my gift. Okay. My gift of music. My okay. gift of my gift of leadership. Okay. Yeah. Let's. I know we know the music part. Uh -huh. Tell me about the leadership part. Where does that leadership come into play? And when did you notice that you were a natural leader in that regard? Okay. I knew I was a natural leader when I knew I was a, a natural follower. I was, mm. a, I was a follower first. Mm. Uh, I played for a lot of people, not being a music director, sitting okay. up under a lot of people, knowing how to serve and taking on visions and just pu pushing visions. Wait you know? a say that one more time, knowing how to serve. Knowing how to serve. What does that mean? Serve meaning taking the vision of whomever you're serving and, and running with it as, as it is yours, you know? Like trying to push that person to, to the next level, being humble, you know? Just not wanting to be on top, but understanding that you're serving and you're learning at the same time. How, how important is being humble? To you, humble is it's super important, and you can't fake humble. A lot of people say I'm humble, but you know, if you're real, you can recognize that somebody ain't real about being humble. Right, right. But hum humble can open up so many doors for you that that your gift can't. You know, really? it's your character, and this in this business, in any business, it's ninety percent character and and just your character and spirit. Like ten percent is your gift. What does character mean to you? Character means everything. That that unlocks so many doors. It's, it's, it's about being prompt. It's about treating people right. It's about, you know, just being that leader, just mm -hmm. being a positive role model. Well, I'll tell you what character means to me is, mm -hmm. is what you do when no one's looking. Absolutely. What you do when no one's looking, Absolutely. that defines your character. Absolutely. If you're the cat that steal the money off the dresser because ain't nobody yeah. looking, yeah. that says who you are. If Absolutely. you're a person that somebody dropped their wallet mm -hmm. and they didn't see it and you like, hey, 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 yeah. you dropped your wallet to make sure they get, right. it, get it, that's character too. Right. So, so thank you for that. Thank yes, you for sir. that. So listen, go back. Mm -hmm. When did you first realize you was a black man? Man, before I realized I was a black man, I realized I was a black boy first. Really? Growing up in Kyrieville. Was it a moment? It was definitely a moment. You know, okay. growing up in Kyrieville, it's predominantly white. I went okay. to predominantly white high school, Kyrieville High School, and, you know, just seeing how white kids were treated differently than, than mm -hmm. us black kids. You know, I grew up in Kyrieville, but people don't know it's the south side of Kyrieville across the railroad tracks. That's the black side of Kyrieville. So there's you know, a black side to Kyrieville? Black Kyrieville? side. The south side of Kyrieville across <laughs> the tracks. The south side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The hood, you know, the hood. It is <laughs> banging in Kyrieville. It is like <laughs> okay. honestly, like, and some white kids were told not to go across the tracks. You know? Oh wow! Yeah, because it's it was that going on. Uh -huh. uh, a lot. It wasn't a lot of violence and killing and a lot of stuff that happened. You don't see it on the news because, right? You know, we keep that covered up. But I realized I was a black boy before, first, and then when I turned seventeen, I had mm -hmm. my first child. Uh -huh. I knew I was a black man. Okay. I knew I was a black man because I knew I had responsibilities. I knew I wasn't living for myself. Right. I knew every decision that I made affected my, my child. Uh -huh. And then just learning about Dr. King, Rodney King, and other great legends that, that went on. Right. And, and that struggle, like, I knew that I was a black boy becoming a black man. Man, you had a kid at 17. At 17. What what was that like, and how did you know that it, w it meant you needed to step up to be a father? Right. Where did that knowledge mm -hmm. come from mm -hmm. at 17? It really was the, the, my upbringing. Like I said, from my mom and my aunts, you know, uh, the odds were against me when I was 17. Like, people thought I'd drop out of school and... And none of that. And I honestly, I had a child at 17. I was so in love, you know. I didn't. And my 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 girlfriend, my kid's mother, she didn't she didn't go to my school, so she was from Memphis. So uh -huh. you know, I'm on punishment. I couldn't see her. <laughs> <You> <laughs> don't I, with a baby we don't <laughs> we don't go to school together. So you know, I I had to pretty much make it to where we could never, you know, not be together. So right. that, that was kind of that was on purpose. My 17 year old okay. uh, at that when I was 17, well, when I had him, but I just. 
it was just in me, naturally in me to be there for my son. Okay, I'm gonna take you back. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take you back. What was that little girl's name? The first girl that just had you just totally nose wide open. Uh, you, you had a flashlight on in the daylight. What? Tell me that girl's uh, name. Oh man, I, I was young. I don't even want to mention her name. <laughs> Come on, man. It's I don't the journey. Know, man. The people gotta know you know that about Marcus it, is a real brother. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, yeah. Uh, it, I mean, back in the day when I was younger, playing in church, you know, my, mm -hmm. my first first love or whatever. You okay. know, I had my nose wide open. Right. You know, just. When did you snap out of it? I snapped out of it when I, honestly, when I played gospel, I was, you know, I'm a musician. So right. I lived that life of right. talking to different women, you know, like that came with the territory. I'm from Kyrieville. I wasn't used to all the attention right. of women. So when I started playing for community choirs, mm -hmm. like oh, all those women, they came towards me. They came towards us because we was touchable. Like right. they let you know how good you sound and how good okay. you was playing and all that type of stuff. And okay. I, I fed into it like anybody else. I, I'm not not hiding it. I had my whole stage just of, of life, and you know, I realized that you know that wasn't the right thing to do on the path that I'm trying to pursue. So you you had some self correcting, self correcting for sure. Yeah. For so, sure. So tell me, what was the moment that you said, you know what, this ain't. I, I need to live for that higher purpose now. Right. Honestly, when I got hurt for the first time, you know, okay. understanding and feeling what hurt feels like, and then having a little girl, my second child is, is a girl. So okay. that changed the whole perspective of, you know, dating and, you know, how you treat women and all that type of stuff. Because I know right. I don't want nobody to treat my daughter how I done treated right. different women. Right. Okay. Tell me what it was like with your pops. My pops? Yeah. What was he like? My pops, he, he's a quartet guy. He's a, he's a country country boy. Okay. So you know, um, when he came around, uh, when, when I got more active in my father's life, um, he was very influential in music because he loved music and, and he pushed me. You know, like he he was always showing me what a real man should do. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I even to this day I always be like, nah, my dad is a real man wouldn't do that. You know, like not saying everything that he said is right. But you know, like he's, I always wanted to be like him, still want to be like him, you know, in, in certain ways as being a man. Like he really gave me the model of, of what a man can do in survival mode. Then you mentioned you have a stepfather. I do. How, is there, was there ever a time that you wondered about who you should really gravitate towards or, or or who should you listen to the most or right. has there ever been a, a period where maybe there was conflicting messages mm -hmm. from those two key figures in your life it was but i, I kind of looked at it as as a great blend you know okay. i can take a lot from my father but i can take a lot from my stepfather see i hate calling stepdad because he's been like a real daddy in my life mm -hmm. like because he's the one that put me on the path of music like he was the one that showed me a lot because he was in the house with me, you know, and he never treated me like an outside child. Mm -hmm. Like I always felt like his son, you know, and I had my father over here and you know, sometimes it can be the conflicts of your, your mom saying one thing about your right. dad, like this and that, right, but right. I always, as a child, I always defended my father, even even if she was right, you know, it's just the thing mm -hmm. about being a child, you don't want nobody talking about your daddy or whatever. Did and you ever say, did you ever have one of the moments to say, you ain't my daddy? I have. I <laughs> Man, I got whooped on my mama wedding day. Oh, I, cause I said no. I, I told her I was crying, and she asked me why I was crying. I said, "Well, why you got to marry that punk?" <laughs> and man, she told me up really on her wedding day. Yep, she did. Oh my goodness! It was just me being spoiled. I'm so used to being the the, the only child at the right, time. You right, know, I right. didn't want my mama to get married. I can understand yep. that. I can certainly understand. It's your first love. Yeah. So tell me about your high school years, mm -hmm. man. I mean, what was that like? I mean, because you were already mm -hmm. musician, playing right. and things like right. that. How did high school, what role did high school play in your development? Uh, high school, well, I did want to play sports. Like every oh, every did. every boy okay. wanted to play sports, but I knew music was my thing. I like making quick money. Like I was playing for <laughs> church. <laughs> I was playing for churches, and you know back then, Sunday. churches were giving me ones. Give that was I was getting the, the the offering money, so I had maybe like two hundred fifty in ones in my pocket. So <laughs> everybody in school club. thought I was the rich kid. <laughs> <laughs> I put that twenty on top of them ones. Okay, <laughs> Swole. I was flying good in high school, <laughs> but uh, I was like I said, I, I did a competition, an NAACP competition, and it was on classical music, <laughs> and did this competition. I actually won first place right. then they asked me for my sheet music right. and I was like I don't got sheet music and I was like what you played that without sheet music I was like yeah she was like well who composed it 
I said, I just made it up when I sat down. And they took that award from me because one of the criteria was you had to have sheet music. Oh, my god. Had goodness. to have sheet music. But you won. You I actually won. won. And they took it away from me. Wow. Was that one of the proudest moments? Or, uh, or if not, <laughs> mm -hmm. tell us when one of the proudest moments of mm -hmm. Marcus Malone's life. Um, that was one of my proudest moments in high school. But one of my proudest moments was starting my own school, uh, School of Music. Really? Yeah, I, I started the school as me just teaching piano, and uh -huh. then it grew to teaching guitar lessons, drum lessons, vocal lessons, dance lessons. Then from that, that grew into a summer camp for children, dream kids, okay. you know, and then from that, I started an event called Church Girls Rock, where okay. we honor women in the church. I was the first person in Memphis to have an all-girls band, all-girls choir, and we honored women of the city. Told you he was a visionary <laughs> and innovator. Z, I ain't mad to you. Yeah, so from that, I got the call to play with Cameo in London. Really? Uh, Kirk Clayton, shout out to Kirk Clayton. He yeah. called, they called him to KC. do the gig. He couldn't do it. He referred me. They sent me 22 songs, five different shows. Just no, I didn't know nobody. I went to London, played with people like Jonathan Moffat, which was Michael Jackson's drummer. Right. Killed that gig and the rest been history. And then I got the call to play with Stephanie Mills. I was supposed to be the sub. Mm -hmm. And my friend Wallace Walker, shout out to Wallace, he called me in to be the sub. And we had a moment in rehearsal that was unscript. She sung this song, It'll Be All Over in the Morning. Right. So the crazy part about this, I had a dream about this song. Woke up in my from my sleep, went to my piano and started playing that song in the wrong key. It was in the wrong key that I was playing it in. I just played what I heard in my dreams. Right. When I went to the rehearsal, we had an off script moment. She started singing that song in the same wrong key. Whoa. And when we got done, she said, I got to have him a part of my band. I don't know how we're going to make it work. She told her manager, make it work. So they added me as a third keyboard player. Like that's really unheard of to have three keyboard players. Mm. So I created a lane in that. And from that, I grew into being her music director. I'm her producer. She had stopped creating music maybe like 20 years. So I'm the first youngest producer to ever produce her in a long time. Okay. Do you, do you see yourself in ever, ever a point where you have had to decide, am I going to do these programs and work with these kids or am I gonna go on this world tour? Right, and I took a break. I took a break for about three years now from doing summer camps and all that because I was like, Maybe God got me out on the road for a reason to make other connections and you know relationships and stuff. So when I come back and do this stuff, I have more to bring back into right. it. Like I kind of went to a selfish mode of let me live for me because I've always lived for everybody else. Right. I always making sure everybody else is good. So I said, let me take take a minute and do something for me right now. Any regrets? Any any regrets in anything you've done? Mm -hmm. You know, in your career? Not too many regrets because it all made me who I am. Uh, I just wish I wouldn't have grew up so fast, you know, took my time and really learned about financial literature. Like I made a lot of money, you know, right. and it went through my hands, you know, not really having those mentors to say, this is what you do when you get money, you know, so. The 17 kid, the, the kid that you had at 17, mm -hmm. if you could change the date of that 17 year old, what age would you move that birth to? Mm. I maybe would have moved after college. I, I always dream. I wish I would have went to college and experienced the college life, living on campus and all that. I okay. wish I would have lived a little bit as a a youth, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's a, I had a baby at twenty, and that really and literally it it it, it really truncated and mitigated the amount of opportunities that mm -hmm. you could experience because you always thinking. I got this kid. Oh, right. I can't go to New York. I right. got this kid. You know, right, it's, it's, right, a, it's, right. it's those things that, right. that those opportunities mm -hmm. that you tend to not be able to take advantage of. That's true. All right. If you could talk to your younger self. No, no, I got it better. I want to set it up differently. Okay. You walking, you, you behind the keyboards, you working it out. Mm -hmm. You playing Saturday morning, getting your Sunday, mo your yeah. Sunday game yeah. on. Uh -huh. See a man walk in the door. You look up at him a little bit, you put your head back down. Okay. The guy walks up to you. It's you. It's you right today. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that kid if you could talk to that boy that was playing that, that keyboard? What would you say to him? I would say, man, be you. Nobody can beat you being you. You know, take what you can from other people but 
cultivate your own sound, you know, and just don't rush the process. Don't hate on nobody getting there, you know, because in due season, your time is going to come. I would tell them, I always keep a jar of mud near you. A jar of mud? A jar of mud to know where you come from. Ooh, <laughs> you got to unpack that one, Marcus. You can't get away with that one. Come on, tell me about the jar yeah, of mud. You got to because a lot of Where did of, that you know, come from? A lot of times when we when we get successful and we get up in status, like we forget where we come from and we start looking down on others and not helping other people, you know? Like we get cocky and we just start smelling ourselves. When we start to smell yourself, just keep that jar of mud near you so you can smell that to know where you come from and where you are can be stripped tomorrow. Wow, that's amazing. I love that. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Now, was that given to you by somebody? Yeah, that was given to me. Okay, yeah. who, 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 shout out my, to my, Shout out to Jonathan Raven. My, that's one of my closest friends. Like, he an old soul, too. But, okay. But we, he played with me with Stephanie Mills, too. He plays bass. Okay. And every time we came up together playing in a band called Prosody, and, like, when we on the road, sometimes we just sit back and, like, we don't never want to get cocky. We don't never want to get, like, look like we looking down on people like when, when we when we do when we feel ourselves doing it we'll say remember that jaw let's keep right. this yeah let's keep this jaw right here so we can know where we come from because we can be back at the house playing in the, just all the little not knocking the clubs around here, but that's that's all we can be doing right right you've been blessed yeah yes yeah, sir respect those blessings marcus this is it it's the last question um but not necessarily a question i want you to talk to these people that are listening to you, mm -hmm. watching you, and 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 wanting to take something from you, leave mm -hmm. them with a Marcus Malonism that they will know that they watched this episode of the journey mm -hmm. that they can take with them and right. say it right there okay. in that camera. Okay. Keep God first, first. Keep God first. Know that your time is coming in due season. Don't rush the process. Know that everything is working together for your good. Don't hate on nobody to get to the top. Celebrate others. Learn how to be a great follower so you can be a great leader one day. Know that life is a marathon and not a sprint. Everything is not going to happen fast. And everything that happened fast don't mean that it's a good thing, you know. Uh, stay humble. Uh, be, be mindful of the people that you surround yourself around because uh, those people can influence you to go in the wrong path. Honor your mother and your father so you can live longer, so you can enjoy the, the harvest that you're about to reap in this season. And just continue to trust God and, and help others. That's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing. Now, like you said, or like we said at the beginning, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. Is there any doubt that Marcus Malone loves what he does? I don't think so. For Marcus Malone. Thank you, sir. For the team here at Kazookian and The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson. Till next time. Thank you to our partners at Nike's Black Community Commitment. To hear more incredible stories like this, be sure to download the Kazookian app from the App Store or Google Play. Or check out the Journey Memphis podcast on all your major podcast providers. Also, check us out on the Kazookian Network.